Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is animal communication, social media in the bush. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Conan Dumanil. Thank you so much for being here today, Conan, and for bringing us such a fun topic. Let's get down to it. Hey, Sadi, thank you very much. And hello to all our viewers. Yes, we can't escape social media, can we? And uh, while I was thinking um, of uh, doing this presentation where we can mix something that I know all too well, um, that is being out there in the jungle and looking at signs and interpreting that. And something that I don't know very well is how to have a presence on social media. But here we go today, we we'll bring both these topics together and just look at uh, communications really from, from an animal perspective and, and what they uh, and what it means. Now, I've been doing the series, uh, I'm in episode two now, and um, the intention is to take you beyond what we see or, or talk about on a wildlife watching trip or a, or a safari and delve a little bit into the ecology and the science behind you know what we see happen in the bush around us or, or even for that matter if you're out walking the dog on a nature trail just understand a little bit what then what is visually apparent and uh, as part of my ongoing series uh, today i want to talk to you about animal uh, communication now Animals use a variety of ways to communicate and much like us humans and, and a lot of this we will relate to as humans as well, uh, is that they seek recognition, acceptance, uh, status, uh, display, defend. These are all various things that they use communication for. And communications can be between two individuals. It can be uh, interspecies between uh, a couple of different species in the animal kingdom. And in this presentation, I'd like to cover some interesting channels of communications that uh, animals use uh, in their society, or I, as I like to call it, uh, the social media in the bush. Now, I've been uh, guiding for almost 20 years now, and I've been fascinated uh, not by just spotting animals out there, which is a thrill in itself, but rather than rather that I, I prefer observing animals and watching how they interact uh, with each other. Now, there are there are a variety of interactions, and uh, you know the trick to this is to spend a lot of time uh, as much as you can and look beyond the apparent and and look a little bit more deeply into what they're doing. And a few weeks ago, I was out on our first uh, trip of the season to Nepal and Bhutan. And we were tracking out rhinos in, in, the, in the grasslands of Chitwa National Park. And we were talking about, uh, well, one rather peculiar habit of, uh, of rhinos. And I was talking about with the guests that were with me on the trip. And that sort of got me inspired uh, to do this whole webinar based on that, that little conversation uh, that we had out there. And uh, I'll get to the rhino story uh, or the topic that we're talking about the rhino uh, later on during this presentation. So when we look at animal communications, right, there, there are about five ways in which I kind of put them down to what uh, or, or ways in which they communicate with each other or, or within uh, their species. And uh, a lot of this and these, of course, mind you, are non-verbal communication. So these uh, humans right now are the only ones who, who are considered communicators in the verbal sense of things. But then there's also a variety of, of other forms that can follow. And these sort of broke them, broken them down into five different ways. Now, starting with sort of the visual experience, this is something that uh, a lot of us will be uh, familiar with. Um, I'm sorry, there seems to be, well, there was a nice little graphic I had down at the bottom, but seems to be blurred out for some reason. Anyway, we'll, we'll move beyond that. Um, visual cues, consists of you know, body language, facial expressions, color changes in some species. And I like to call this the sort of the Facebook wall of, of clues or cues that you might have. You know, if for those of you are familiar with Facebook, uh, you need no explanation, but you know, the wall is something where we all, you know, you can display your mood, you can say what you, what thoughts are at the top of your head and all of that. So it's, it's that one place 
which everyone relates to. It is very visual. Uh, it is interpretive uh, from that sense. And this is where everything hangs out. So talking about visual signals with animals, um, you know, we see we see dogs wagging the tails. We know what that means. It's happiness. If you've seen a cat with its back arched, you know exactly uh, what that means. And you know, much like uh, much like humans, uh, animals convey a lot through their posture and and movements. Now we've seen especially with with primates, uh, a lot of these ex uh, expressions are in their face. Now, for those of you who have spent time out in Africa, South America, or Asia, uh, where we have a variety of primates to choose from, and there's a variety of trips uh, that we run at NatApp to go and look for specific primates. Uh, two, of, two of my favorite uh, pictures are up here right now. And uh, if you look at the one on, on the left, it's it's actually a picture of a, of a gray langur, which is found in the Indian subcontinent. And it actually almost looks like it's it's smiling. And uh, and whereas in opposition to it, uh, you have uh, the lion-tailed macaque, which is found in a very, very small region, only in southern India. Uh, teeth barred, a very, very aggressive posture, um, almost looks like he's yawning. But these two different things mean, I mean, these two different postures mean very, very uh, different things. And expressive faces are not limited uh, to humans. Now, primates, of course, we we consider them almost emotive as as humans, other non-human primates, and uh, are very very uh, uh, very very uh, explicit in what uh, the kind of behavior they display. And uh, you just have to spend hours, and you can you can see the various dynamics uh, that happen within you know a little troop or within a little small society or family of these primates. Most primates that we encounter on our trips are social so there's a there's a whole lot of activity that happens within the group and we'll be talking about uh, something else along the presentation but very very expressive faces and they're one of the few species that actually use facial expressions a lot uh, in communication for those of you who studied classical dance um, will know facial exp uh, expressions are key uh, to that art form in itself and uh, you know, the going behind the philosophy of each expression and what it means, uh, we see very, very similar things in the non-human primate world as well. Uh, apart from facial expressions, there's also color changes that happen. And I think these two species up here on your screen right now uh, symbolize or sort of personify the best sort of color uh, communication or color cues that we've seen anywhere in, in the natural world. Cuttlefish, are fantastic creatures and I think they warrant a webinar in by itself. Uh, you could talk about cuttlefish communication for hours to come. Uh, they are considered uh, some of the most intelligent uh, species and in terms of brain to body size uh, ratio, it's it's very, very large. So they're definitely an intelligent animal, not a dumb old fish that we see swimming in the seas. And a large brain uh, controls a lot of their, their communication. Now, while I was researching cuttlefish, I actually found uh, scientists have a communication chart which they've deciphered, which we have deciphered from cuttlefish. And some species are known to have about 35 different uh, messages which they're able to communicate. And these messages consist of uh, not just color combination, uh, but the texture of their skin, which they can also control, by the way, uh, the positioning of their uh, tentacles and the body, and also the locomotive uh, pattern that they use. So all of these four things combined together, so color, uh, texture, position, and locomotive combined together, and they can form uh, a, a message that they want to display. Uh, and, and all of these message, of course, as I studied, it could be anything for signaling for a mating behavior, aggression, defensive postures, various and so on and so forth. But let's just talk about color for a second there. Now, cuttlefish have uh, sort of chromatophores and um, across their body. And these actually not only reflect light, but also are able to produce uh, certain elements. And even though cut cuttlefish are not sensitive or they don't see the entire color spectrum. In fact, they, they're pretty much color blind, uh, but 
what they do is, which is invisible to the uh, to the human eye, is that they can reach really, really high definitions of polarization. Now, if you've taken pictures on a bright sunny day, you know exactly what I mean about, you know, the light is scattered, it's all over, all over the place. Polarization helps you kind of condense that light into a particular wavelength, and that's what cuttlefish are able to do uh, so effectively well. And one will think, you know, that's where the, the color and the texture of the skin comes into play, where they're able to condense uh, waves of light into a particular waveform, which is then used as a very, very complex, very, very sophisticated uh, way of communicating, uh, not just to their species, but also other species as well, warning of, of danger and so on. Now, chameleons, on the other hand, um, some of us might be more familiar with and, and, and seen them, but they also do the uh, perform in, sort of in the same principle as a cuttlefish. They're able to change color very rapidly. Now, it's often mistaken that chameleons change color according to the environment. Now, with while this is true to a certain extent, uh, there is geographical variation in the same species. Uh, for example, the panther chameleon, which we see here, is found across Madagascar, uh, Reunion Island, and Mauritius. Uh, in their geographical range itself, uh, you know, species from the northern part of the islands look more gray, uh, more reds, and species in the southern part of the islands can be more green or blue. So while there is a variation in kind of that default coloration, we know chameleons can also change the color, and and most of the color changes happens. Uh, due to the mood they're feeling at that point of time. So when I say mood, it could mean, uh, again, a dominance or a readiness to mate or if two males size off. And and one of the best things uh, you, you'll ever see in the natural world, and I was really lucky to observe this once, uh, not with the panther chameleons, but with the Indian chameleons here, is two males squaring off against each other. It's a very slow battle. It's not action packed like you know one would imagine from a you know nice Arnold Schwarzenegger movie but um, so there's very slow posturing but happens uh, that happens and it, it takes forever but what changes rapidly is the colors and the patterns that they have and there's all of these flashy it's all flash uh, and very rarely do chameleons actually engage in combat and um, it has been known that once they engage in combat the victor often goes back you know, wearing his colors and uh, the loser retreats away and often the body will change into a very, very drab coloration. So apart from just the environment, the, the colors also signal the mood they're feeling. And, and that's, uh, I think, absolutely fantastic and, you know, boggles the human mind that a creature who we think, or creatures that we think are much lesser than ourselves are actually capable of such complex forms of uh, communication. Now, another form um, which we are all too familiar with uh, is the auditory sense of how animals communicate with each other. Now, a few weeks ago, I did a separate uh, webinar on just animal calls, and I encourage you to go ahead and, and look at that, where we looked at different animal calls and what they meant <clears throat> uh, uh, with the whole and, and how they communicate with each other. But when we're looking at, at this in, in this in the sense of a social communication, I like to call this is like the animal version of, of TikTok or the jungle TikTok, where you know you've got all of these complex vocalizations happening between certain species. And again, it is not for themselves, it is an advertisement to society at large. It could be within the species and it could be extra species as well. And there's all of these ranges and pitches and frequencies and, and different patterns uh, uh, that they uh, that animals use to vocalize. And all of it is for the benefit of, of their society or rather an advertisement to society of what they're doing. And I can't think of a better parallel than, you know, those funny TikTok videos which you see people dancing or, or singing in the shower or so on. So, you know, that's this is the jungle version of it. Now, <clears throat> canines, we know vocalize a lot. Um, wolves uh, can, I mean, they howl, jackals as well, howl and yell. And a lot of this is is done so they can cover a large range. So they're able to signal to the rest members uh, of, of the pack and, um, and also just advertise 
uh, as to the location and and it's also a form of of a social contact or they make these contact calls between various individuals now it's not just them but you know we've from bird song to whale calls there are various sounds to come to communicate and <coughs> excuse me most of these communications can be to convey danger it could be mating calls it could be territorial warnings and so much more so one of the most complex uh, things that i've i've come to know in in the recent uh, past even though you know i lived around these these birds for quite some time uh, is that zebra finches have some of the the most intricate of of conversations between them now uh, they are native to australia but it's also a very very popular pet species uh, of birds and um, one of the places where i used to work earlier we had a cage full of zebra finches and it was always nice because through the day you hear this constant uh, chatter now we in in humans and i and i mentioned this in, in a webinar earlier as well uh, you know in humans we we talk about you know, parenting and, and raising kids and you know how important that social interaction is to you know the development of of speech and and language you know we we pass on uh, words to babies, you know, talk about baby talk, and then there's slightly sophisticated words as a uh, child grows up. And so similarly, songbirds actually learn a lot of their vocalizations uh, during development. And studies in the zebra fin show that, uh, you know, social interactions rapidly uh, enhance the vocal learning, uh, you know, giving attention to particular songs. And there is also activity which, you know, sort of the, the kind of social activity uh, stimulates a, a hormone uh, in in the system that uh, that helps with the generation of neurons, and those particular neurons are responsible uh, for those vocalizations. So it's it's they they are a social bird, and uh, data shows that you know the more social they are, the better they are at um, at vocalizing. Um, but one of the coolest parts of the study I was I was reading about is that adult zebra finches. Uh, when when they analyzed the calls, they actually found uh, that between adults there were more a different set of calls, a more complex set of of signals that they emitted. Uh, but they would alter their vocalizations when when interacting with the younger ones, which means that you know our version of what we know as as baby talk, uh, zebra finches are capable of doing that. And um, yeah, it is it's just an amazing. Uh, um, a situation where you see this again this really tiny tiny uh, bird but you know capable of such complex uh, you know interactions amongst themselves so a lot of their their communication is socially learned uh, much like our families and social structures where we adapt we look at things being posted uh, somewhere and you know that modifies our behavior well zebra finches i think got it long before uh, we did now, another form of, of communication which serves a more practical purpose, I would say, or a more uh, a basic need, is we're all familiar with echolocation, uh, and bats are, you know, sort of uh, the best at this. And this sort of handsome fella here is the greater spear-nosed bat from Central and South America, and uh, so they use, well, practically what we know as radar uh, to hunt, uh, which is a great tool if you're hunting hunting for fruits in the in the dark or insects in the dark. Now, the spear, uh, spear-nosed uh, bat has a very, very broad uh, bandwidth that they, they uh, emit sounds in. And understanding sound, uh, when, when you get, get a little bit into, into the understanding of it, you'll realize that different sounds across the wavelength have, well, if used in a practical purposes, a purpose like this, can have different functions. And bats use very, very high-pitched sounds where they're able to perceive shorter distance and have a more 3D image of, of that. So they're able to perceive depth and, um, and also the frequency of uh, high, a high frequency sound against a wall, an echo, is much larger than a low frequency sound. So that's how they're able to form this 3D map of everything around them. And they can look at something as, as close as, uh, and, and they, they can resolve distances as close as four millimeters, which is, Fantastic. I mean, again, it, it just uh, boggles the mind. And apart from just finding food, um, they also have a very, very interesting social structure. 
And uh, so usually there's one alpha male that hangs about with this little harem of close to a dozen females. And uh, so where, they, where they're roosting up in the day, and it's usually the alpha male that starts the activity in the evening. And uh, they use special frequencies to signal, uh, which is almost like a language in itself, uh, a special frequency to signal what the activity is, if it's time to go hunt, or uh, and, and then the rest of the, um, well, the rest of the, the group follows as well. So, so you have a big boy or big daddy there with all his females and, you know, he talks to them and then you have all the bachelor groups hanging around on the other side who have their own set of communication uh, growing. And um, yeah, I mean, all, all of this is, is, is a bit familiar sometimes to us. Now, uh, speaking of, of uh, frequencies, now elephants, on the other hand, and uh, on completely on the opposite spectrum of the bats, elephants use low frequencies. And uh, when you study elephants, uh, both Asian and African elephants, and uh, the, the herds during, when, when they're grazing, when, when, they're, when they're feeding through, uh, the herds can get dispersed. And uh, in, in Africa, uh, it's at least depending on the terrain they are, it's more open, so they can have a visual contact of each other. But elephants, don't have a very, very strong scent, uh, sense of eyesight. They, they make it up in, in smell. And in Asian elephants, when you compare it, especially if you're, if you're on a trip with us um, in, in the eastern part of India, where in Kaziranga, where you have grasslands interspersed by forests, sometimes these herds get dispersed between the forest. So you don't have any uh, visual uh, access on, on the rest of the herd. So then you have to rely on scent and sound. And this is where those low frequencies come in. And these frequencies are much lower uh, than the human auditory scale. So below 20 hertz, they, they emit these low rumbles, which, you know, I've heard some uh, old forest guides tell that they can actually feel the vibration if they're close enough. Uh, but a lot of this can't be felt, but we uh, heard, but we can feel it. And with special equipment, you can measure it. But if you're around a herd of elephant, next time and if you pay closer attention you will hear some rumbles that are audible to us there, there's these little chuffing and you know these low sort of vibratory rumbles which you hear much like a subwoofer uh, in your home theater system you'll feel these rumbles going and and that's how they sort of communicate and keep in touch with the herd and again like a lot of uh, evolved mammals they have their own language for adults for kids, uh, I mean, for the young ones especially, uh, and there's a lot of these uh, uh, intimate moments. If you look at mothers with calves, um, you know, apart from just touching bodies and reinforcing those so social bonds, there's also a very, very different uh, set of calls that they have. <clears throat> Speaking of social bonds and and um, and behavior, uh, we look at the next form of communication. Uh, which is very, very behavioral based. So apart from body language and auditory, we also have a kind of a ritualized uh, pattern, uh, so to speak, that, you know, we, we uh, that animals also use. And again, I, I, I draw a comparison to, you know, when you're, when you're looking at Insta Reels from around the world, uh, you know, you talk about something gone viral, uh, you know, you got one dance move that started in Russia somewhere and then, you know, two weeks later, it's 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 in Fiji, and then after that, it's in Chile, and then it's back in in the United States. It's it's a viral hit that goes around the world, and these are sort of ritualized patterns um, that one species, uh, or rather, interspecies or in, interrace adopts from each other. But in the animal kingdom, we see a lot of ritualized uh, behavior uh, within the same species, and and if we look at interspecies communications in terms of, of behavior, we have a phenomenon called mimicry, which I'll talk to you about. Uh, I think when you look at behavioral patterns um, or, or behavioral ritual, so to speak, the birds of paradise that are found in Papua New Guinea, uh, I think are the best, best sort of exemplars of this, uh, this kind of routine. And I don't think anyone else does it better than the birds of paradise. Now, this is a, again, a, a specific species. Uh, this is the Vogelkopf's superb bird of paradise. And while they, you know, it's recently be described as a new species based on 
just the particular dance routine that it does to woo the females. Now, Birds of Paradise, of course, there, I, I, if I remember rightly, I think there are close to about 108 species of just Birds of Paradise in itself. Um, I, but even amongst them, there are, there, there are certain species with minute differences, and all of them are found within you know, isolated patches of the New Guinean rainforest. And uh, so the Vogel Corps uh, was just recently split from the Super Bird of Paradise because uh, it has been noted and uh, studied and noted that it does have a specific uh, routine in itself. And I, I urge you, uh, check out BBC's Planet Earth. Uh, they have a beautiful documentation, a beautiful video of, of this uh, routine right from start to finish. Um, look it up. Uh, I think the clips are there on YouTube as well. I cannot do justice uh, by explaining. But <clears throat> I tell you, so, so you know, in the far western part of, of uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, this is where they are found. And um, so being very, very distinct from similar species as well, uh, and there are more widespread species across the island that have similar routines as well. But all of them, in, in essence, uh, is a specific routine where the male, of course, gets into a position, uh, usually out in a forest clearing, because these, again, rem remember, this is thick rainforest. So he has to get out into a little small patch of clearing amongst the bushes on the ground and then starts his whole display. And then an interested female who is usually around in, in the underbrush uh, if she's interested, will will fly down close to him and uh, show her appreciation, uh, and we'll, that's that's part of their their courtship. Uh, again, you have to watch this. Uh, you know, or any birds of paradise. There's an entire series of them, uh, which the BBC has has done. And uh, yeah, so this one's also called the smiley face bird because you know it's very bouncy and you know, it holds its wings out together like this. The bright iridescent blue forms a nice smiley face and an otherwise very, very black body. <clears throat> now, moving along uh, to the next behavioral set. Now, this again is for other reasons, not just courtship and mating, but more from uh, a defense perspective. Now, looking at this collage right here, I'll tell you, none of them are snakes. Any guesses for what they might be? It's probably the last thing that comes into mind. <clears throat> Now these, in, in fact, are larvae or caterpillars of uh, various hawk moths, uh, most of them found uh, in, in the New World. And um, when, when threatened, uh, these caterpillars sometimes will retract the leg, display these colors on their back, which resembles uh, snakes. Now in, in ecology or in, in biology, we call this mimicry, and there are various forms of mimicry. Uh, which again, I'm going to be covering in a couple of uh, weeks from now, speaking specifically about uh, coevolution and and how animals and different species evolve together and benefit or don't benefit from each other. Uh, this this form of mimicry is is a defensive mimicry where a seemingly harmless animal will take on the coloration or pattern of a species that's considered aggressive. So here we're looking at cat caterpillars that have various um, appendages and color patterns that can resemble pit vipers, which are found, uh, excuse me, in the new world. And um, again, this forms a very, very defensive purpose for them. Uh, certain caterpillars can only change into these colors at a particular point of, of their uh, life just before molt. And um, but most of them are uh, are also as they start growing uh, can have some uh, patterns as as well right from the get go. So uh, it, it's very interesting because birds have known to avoid them, and this is a survival uh, strategy. So while it's not communicating anything to its own species, it's definitely a communication to the world at large. Is that hey, look at me, I'm dangerous. Uh, don't come near me. Um, and again, it boggles the mind uh, how these things can actually uh, happen. A, a seemingly larvae stage of an animal, something that is not really spent, had its time in the world, has a pattern that already mimics something that is a known uh, danger. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a scientific, uh, I mean, there is a scientific explanation by this, but, you know, more human explanation is just, you know, it just escapes the mind. Um, 
again more on the behavioral side of things uh, we see in other forms of com uh, communication and this is again not just uh, pertinent to humans alone but if you look at tactile com uh, communication is where you use touch uh, as a feel uh, that reinforces uh, social bonds and it's not just humans who do it but you know a lot of animals do it too uh, if you ever had a, a dog at home you'll know exactly what i mean uh, it could be sitting out on the front porch or next to the fire, but the moment you sit down on your chair, it get up, gets up, walks right across and comes and plops itself right on your feet. And that, again, you know, we often think sometimes it, it's a show of emotion, but it's actually a, a very, it's a strengthening of a social bond. And uh, we've seen primates, again, prime examples of reinforcing this bond. Uh, they take part in social grooming. Uh, and often you'll see troops of monkeys. These are uh, Japanese macaques. Uh, they all sit together and one takes the other. And even here, there is a particular hierarchy that is observed. Usually the higher ones get groomed uh, first and then the lower ones do the grooming. So there's a lot of the, it's like, you know, sending your kids out and do little chores uh, for you. So there's a lot of these, these subliminal messaging or these, uh, you know, part of the communication process that happens from just, just the touch. Uh, but primates are not alone in this. Uh, uh, if you've been to Africa and you've watched uh, a group of cheetahs, you know exactly after a hunt or after they feed, uh, especially the males uh, show a lot of bonding. Brothers bond with each other very well by licking and, and preening each other. Otters have known to do this as well. So <clears throat> many, many mammals uh, by that extension indulge in social grooming and apart from just reinforcing bonds it also serves a very very practical uh, purpose as well uh, big mammals and hair needs a lot of maintenance and uh, so yeah why not get the entire uh, group in or get, get the entire so, uh, society in to, to take care of your your daily preening <clears throat> now moving on to uh, the fifth form of communication and my personal favorite uh, is the chemical messages. Now, these are little organic compounds that convey a lot, really, and, and they can they can convey love, they can uh, convey danger, support, and so on. Um, it's similar, much much to you know our, our sort of emoting that we we express on on uh, as a status or a or a picture update on on a WhatsApp or Insta. So. Uh, Pheromones are part of a, a group of chemicals called semiochemicals, which basically uh, is a chemical that is used primarily for uh, communication. And a pheromone specifically uh, basically means, uh, it's taken from the Greek word, which means ferro and, and hormone, which means uh, impetus gives you action, and ferro means to bear. So it is a, a chemical that's secreted by a wide variety of animals uh, and us included and this chemical triggers a particular social uh, response in members of the same species now if you're looking at the common crow butterfly here on the left of your screen uh, this is a common butterfly form formed across asia <clears throat> excuse me and if you look at the bottom end of his uh, abdomen you'll see these two spiky, al uh, almost looking like grass seeds kind of structures. And um, those are actually dispersal uh, organs that send out these pheromones into the air. So the, the male uh, common crow has this thing and these hair-like hair pencil structures um, will emit these pheromones to attract a female to him. Uh, another good exponent of this are uh, the tiger moths. And uh, in tiger moths, well, the females choose the males that uh, secrete uh, or rather produce the, the most pheromone, which I think honestly is, 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 is a good indicator for the amount of, uh, you know, sort of protective alkaloids that the male has and which, which also comes uh, in, in tandem with the pheromones. Uh, so it offers protection and as well as a good indicator of um, how many uh, offspring she's going to bear because the more pheromones, uh, the male secretes, the more eggs he's likely to fertilize. So, yeah, the number of kids you can have and the offering protections, I think two, two basic needs that uh, the females, at least of the tiger moth, uh, look for. Now, 
uh, these uh, there are various kind of uh, semiochemicals that that are emitted um, again a lot of this can be for communication between other species uh, as well uh, we know of, uh, of of trees that that secrete a particular chemical uh, to warn other trees you know the acacia is a great example when giraffes start to feed of them they start secreting chemicals um, to warn the other species and then develop tannins in the body as a defensive structure and this again is a topic that you know i i could get into and we could speak about hours about this and you know the beautiful world of of chemicals and everything that exists around us but <clears throat> to more relatable examples we've seen cats um, even cats in the wild uh, secrete chemicals and what we call scent marking um, if you're on a tiger trip with us in india um, we have a very good chance of seeing tigers walk out on the territory <clears throat> excuse me sorry walk out on the territory uh, they they use a various forms of communication they scratch the ground they will claw mark put claw marks on a tree or scratch a tree and you know, often we hear people saying that, oh no, they scratched the tree to clean the claws. Um, but actually that's that's an erroneous uh, statement, not entirely true. Uh, there are scent glands uh, that they have, uh, pedal, uh, we call them pedal glands, and they, they, uh, they are there between the digits. And uh, when they extend their claws and scratch it, this actually stimulates those glands to produce a scent, uh, which they leave back on the trees and the areas that they're in, uh, which, is an indicator for uh, territory so this is a territorial marking and in places where there are no trees like snow leopard country out in ladakh uh, snow leopards use rocks and again they have patient glands and they do the same thing you can't scratch your claws on a rock so they use their facial glands instead uh, to rub against rocks and and if you're walking a trail and, and you see there are there are times where you'll actually see a part of the rock that over the years has been scraped or smoothened out by the cats that come in because they're creatures of habits uh, they are, and they come back, uh, they follow the same trail for most times and they will use the same areas to mark the territory uh, as well. So apart from scratching and rubbing, there is also a spray, uh, like you see this tigress in the, the extreme left. Uh, so she, they will come out, uh, raise the tail and then squirt the spray out uh, on top tree or bushes and this smell can when it's fresh as humans we can also smell it and i often describe it as um, a smell that uh, sm it, it smells like boiled rice a particular variety of rice called the basmati which is a long grain rice and it's such a earthy uh, sort of smell when it's when it's fresh and uh, yeah and uh, again that that's a signal to the female that's her territory and the scent can change when she's in estrus so as an indicator to males that she is ready, ready to mate, uh, then there's a different scent uh, altogether. I haven't gotten close enough to uh, a female tiger in Estrus to smell it, so I can't really describe to you what it, uh, what it smells like. Um, <clears throat> but animals, and here's where I, I sidetrack, you know, we've been talking about animals specifically uh, throughout and, uh, you know, something which I, we came across a few years ago, uh, you know, speaking to a plant scientist, uh, which was when I, I discovered this thing called mycelium, uh, which is basically a fungi that is also capable of, of really, really complex uh, and sophisticated uh, communication. Now, most of us think of fungi as mushrooms, uh, but they're just the spore producing bodies, just like the reproductive, uh, which are basically the reproductive organs of the mycelium and they work in a sort of decentralized uh, fashion. And um, mycelium, uh, you see this white structure here is, is a web-like uh, a body that with branching tubes and they're constantly uh, expanding. And some of these uh, can expand to over a great distance. And, and the great, I think the largest um, fungi noted is the honey mushroom uh, that covers almost 10 square kilometers and i think it's it's in the united states as well and it uh, and it has lived for millennia but you know as as the fungi grow they're constantly sensing learning and making decisions um you know depending on the substrate in which they're growing so it could be detritus you know sort of root decaying matter it could be soil and so they're constantly growing out and and they they 
believed at least you know they are able to understand certain forms of communication uh, between species so they're able to in, in for want of a better word speak and understand a wide uh, range of chemical signals and are able to release and respond accordingly to these signals and, and emit their own so and and what's fascinating about this and and there's a there's a book uh, written about mycelium uh, there's a there's a german forester called peter walbian uh, look up his book secret life of trees and there's one about mycelium as well and he talks about them and mycelium is able to pick up these chemical trails that float in air in water and in the soil as well and not only are they able to to communicate within the fungi kingdom but also amongst plant kingdom as well so many plant messaging so say if a tree is under stress by being say being eaten by a beetle uh, it will release certain stress hormones which are then carried by the mycelium and then taken to the other tree um, close by and then that tree receives the message so uh, and, uh, and is able to adopt a defensive strategy and most trees will produce things like tannin uh, so on to make it more inedible for these things so there's this fascinating sort of underground uh, network that uh, you know the, this this german scientist actually peter walbian he calls it the wood wide web and there's this entire network that that exists below ground uh, below where our eyes can see and you know apart from tra transferring water nitrogen carbon other minerals there's also this entire chain of of communication that happens uh, between species which we you know never even thought existed uh, again i i highly recommend the uh, this book's secret life life of trees by peter walbian uh, look it up it's it's a fantastic read <clears throat> now moving on to more movable kinds um, we've seen uh, and this is where my whole idea and back to the rhino story or my whole idea of, uh, of of social media and the animal kingdom came about now rhinos have a very very peculiar habit they are um, they lack uh, very good eyesight uh, but they have a very strong sense of smell and using that sense of smell um, they are able to navigate through their social world and able to understand uh, things that happen around them and how do they do that through these massive dung piles which they call middens yes um, there is what we think is absolutely worthless and of no use it's actually very very uh, good piece of information uh, pun intended uh, for the rhinos so it's like kind of like a rhino mainframe now what happens is now if you if you've seen rhinos in the wild they have this pattern where they will follow particular paths they will day in day out they're again extremely uh, habitual creatures and wherever you've seen rhinos in the landscape you'll always see huge piles of dung and again i try to show pictures that can sort of exemplify this but again seeing is believing when you're out there either in africa or traveling to nepal or india next time look out for these dry, uh, dry, uh, rhino middens and there's this huge pile of dung and so rhinos will come out and they'll defecate on the same pile again and again and and various different individuals will also use uh, piles nearby or on the same pile sometimes and every time you see a rhino for example uh, like this guy uh, on in the larger picture is come out uh, sorry this female has come out of the water uh, she comes out, she walks straight across the sandbank, she goes straight to the dung pile and smells it. And what she's getting from there is a variety of information. Is uh, Are there any other individuals in this area? Is, is there a, a prospective male that she might uh, uh, be interested in? And if it's a male, uh, are there any females on heat? Uh, is there uh, a larger male, more threatening male with stronger hormones and you know, possibly bigger bulk uh, that he has to either leave or, 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 or can stay and fight. All of this information they're able to get just by sniffing a dung pile because this dung pile is rich with chemicals. Uh, it's got scents, it's got, you know, everything, all these little these compounds growing in it uh, and they're able to decipher the information. And so now it makes sense why rhinos have this huge head 
because they actually have a very, very well developed olfactory system uh, in, in the skull, which, you know, translates to, to which uses up most of their, uh, their brain function. Uh, and they're able to translate all of this information uh, from, from this dung pile uh, itself. So <clears throat> we've seen various forms of, uh, of communication throughout uh, in, in the animal world. And uh, I think it is important to stop and understand um, what this communication means. Uh, because often, you know, a lot of this communication is has to be taken in context with the environment as well. Uh, looking at uh, at behavior and this, you know, not just for us guides because we are constantly reading this in the natural world, uh, but also as travelers out going out in the wilderness or going out to parks and on game drives or, or just like I said, a walk on a trail. Uh, this is great information for you uh, in a different dimension. Uh, that helps you observe the natural world in. Now, we we juxtapose all of this co uh, communication with each other, whether it's a verbal communication or different body language, you know, uh, a deer that's standing with its ears facing forward, standing completely erect um, and emitting a warning call. What does that mean? You know, is it is it a sign of, of, of danger? Is it a sign that a predator is nearby? Or, you know, a sleepy monkey on a branch who may make a sound or two. Now, is that a warning call or is that more a contact between um, uh, it's it's true. So you can tell the urgency of of, of the threat or, or what's happening within a social group by just observing all of these different kind of behaviors and and communications uh, together. And interestingly, you know, animals have uh, or can learn and have shown to adapt the communication based on experiences. And and this again, like us. Um, I mean, think about it as as someone who switches countries and then adopts the local accent. You know, think of it that in the animal world, they are able to accentuate or adapt uh, depending on their experiences, and uh, which which allows for you know more flexibility and sort of uh, understanding of of the signals that we see. And I recently experienced this uh, last year for for the very first time. Uh, we were out uh, on a India summer trip, uh, the photo trip where we go to uh, to the park, Ranthambore National Park in Western India, to uh, one of the best places to see tigers in the wild. And so we are, we are constantly, you know, tracking tigers through not just the prints on the uh, on the trail, but also sound. And uh, I, we heard my jeep uh, and a couple of other jeeps nearby as well. We heard a warning sound by spotted deer, and usually. You know, these are sounds that you you stop, you gauge, you kind of see what the urgency is, and and it was quite a rapid call. So I was very excited, and I was like, oh, that's this this one spotted deer, and we just passed a herd, you know, right there, and this sounds rather urgent. And my guide told me something which, I, initially, I was like, what the hell is he talking about? Uh, and he said, you know, it is a spotted deer call. I agree. Uh, but it's it's a male uh, calling uh, because he's interested in a female. Now I was like, no, no, no. You mean a rutting call? And he's like, no, 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 rutting call. Like, you know, we know rutting calls. We've heard them. It sounds very, very different. And so, you know, my guide and me had this little, you know, sort of debate going on in in our jeep. And um, you know, I guess the guests there were looking at us like, what's going on, guys? And I was like, okay. So we have a conflict of opinion. Uh, the guide says one thing and I say something else. Uh, so that means we have to go back and check it out. So they were interested in this little debate we're having. Anyway, we turned the Jeep around and uh, we went, we drove back to this head, a uh, herd. And right enough, there was a male uh, sitting there in the middle of the herd and he had singled out one particular female. And what this male was doing was emitting an alarm call, a genuine alarm call, which they do when they see a tiger or a leopard. He was emitting this call, which kind of signaled to the rest of the herd to leave. But uh, so they thought it was a genuine alarm call and all the, the other deer started leaving. But this male had, had, had singled out, he, he was trying to, uh, this one female from the herd, and then he was not letting her leave. So we stopped by and watched this for about 10 or 15 minutes and he kept calling. And of course the intensity dropped. And I think after some point, the rest of the herd, I, I, I believe at least caught on to this guy's 
plan and then slowly started returning. And, you know, for me, um, of course, it was uh, local guide one, expedition leader zero. Um, but for me, it was the first time I've ever observed this. And I we, we then spoke to a few other people and I've been uh, trying to find out this. And apparently, it's not something that's been reported from anywhere else. So it was very, very specific behavior, probably to that region, if not probably to a few individuals in that region uh, that have known, that have triggered or rather assimilated the, the alarm calls um as a way of getting you know getting to the ladies so this was such a unique behavior which you know you know after you know spending so many years in the field you know nature still you know sort of blows your mind um the you know we've seen so understanding is one thing uh and understanding the purpose of of communication uh is vital as well uh you know when we're out there we we know certain purposes you know whether it's courtship or establishing hierarchies maintaining social bonds uh dominance displays there are there are various uh purposes in which communications are uh, are emitted or, or or social communications are are uh, emitted we are familiar with uh you know the the courtship calls of lions can be can be very very um a, a raucous affair <clears throat> but there is so much that's available in the in the natural world it's it's very very uh, i mean it's incredibly nuanced uh, and then incredibly diverse as well and studying these forms of communication helps us understand you know social structures better it helps us understand behaviors better evolu evolutionary adaptations whether it's it's genetic or learned um we begin to understand this a lot more better once we pay uh, attention to this and and just the richness of the, the various uh, forms of communication uh, reveals what a complex and fascinating world uh, these animals uh, live and and showcase the sort of depth of interactions uh, which you know I, there's only that much words that I can use <clears throat> during this time uh, to talk about it so <clears throat> excuse me I hope I hope you liked uh, you enjoyed watching and and listening um to me ramble about different forms of communication um and at this point i'd like to turn it back over to you sunny and uh, hear from our audience if they have any questions which i'll be uh, happy to try and answer Conan, thank you so much that that was fascinating i will never look at at certain things in nature the same way um, before we start the q a i just want to remind everyone that they can submit questions via the questions field in the control panel. Um, so far, we've got some comments, but no questions. Um, let me see if anybody, one person commented that stallions also exhibit the behavior you were just talking about, which is interesting. I've not heard that before. Um, here's, a, here's a question. Do different rhinos use the same midden? Yes, they can. Uh, they will uh, often uh, larger males when they move into a territory will sort of, you know, for want of a better word, defecate all over the previous guy's uh, parade. Um, so they they do that, and uh, sometimes you'll also you'll also find a collection of middens sometimes from different individuals. So it's not really an exact location, but kind of in the general area, uh, so to speak. That you know sort of sends the message to other rhinos. Interesting. <laughs> um, are the chemical trails of insects like ants based on pheromones or different classes of chemicals? Oh, uh, good question. Uh, now, pheromones is only, uh, I mean, it's only one kind of semiochemicals. Uh, and usually pheromones, the term pheromone is used to indicate um, a chemical that is for mating or courtship. Now, there are other other kinds of semiochemicals, as we call them. Um, which can be for defense, it can be for finding food, it can be a, a communication to the other members of the species like ants use. And um, they all uh, they all fall under different uh, categories. And there are some uh, chemicals um, that also will trigger a particular response in uh, other species. 
for example, if you look at the uh, ponderosa pine in, in North America, which is invaded by the, the pine beetle, now they will em emit a chemical which actually attracts more pine beetles. And, um, and, and, and the, the, so the one tree will then get attract a lot where saving you know, sort of the rest of the species or keeping the rest of the species intact. So, so uh, pheromones is part of a group of chemicals um, called semiochemicals. And there's, again, just to summarize, there are various chemicals that have different functions based on them. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, well, that's the last question we have time for, but I just want to share some comments. Uh, there's a request to contrast signals in water with signals on land in a future episode, so you can start thinking about that. And just lots of praise for bringing us this fascinating topic and for delivering it with such light, colorful, easy to follow um, way that you do it. So thank you, Conan. Um, I'll turn it back to you for closing comments. Sure, sure. Thank, thank you, Sunny, and, and thank you to, to our audience today. Um, I, I hope you, you liked it. I mean, we are constantly searching uh, for topics and, and uh, like you know, I was talking to Sunny uh, before we actually started the webinar, a lot of this is actually inspired by conversations we've had with you. Now, uh, as this, this audience is growing, we've had many people come in on our trips personally, like, hey, we watched your webinar on this, or we saw your friend's webinar on that. And it's it's a lovely conversation. It's lovely to have that feedback also from you. And um, yeah, it just keep, it keeps us going. It keeps us thinking of new topics. Uh, I appreciate the suggestions. I will look into it. Uh, and uh, you thank you again for attending these webinars and uh, you know giving us things to think about and talk about, and especially the stuff we love. So thank you everybody for joining in, and uh, happy holidays to all of you. Enjoy the rest of the week. Happy holidays to you, Conan. I want to also thank everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.